I like front row people, um, except for Matt. No. <laughs> no, I especially I like, like Matthew. That, hey, I've been getting it from everybody. Really? Yeah. Well, I love you. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> I have similar feelings of affection towards you. <laughs> <laughs> and I am very, I'm very glad you're in the front row. I like front row sitters. Thank you. And back row sitters, Joyce. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, the question is, uh, what about like for, um, Sabbath observance? And so we observe the Sabbath just like we observe don't murder and don't steal and uh, have no other gods before me, the rest of the Ten Commandments. We don't pluck out one of the Ten Commandments and say, God's character has changed. All the law flows out of God's character. Uh, God is a God who doesn't need to rest and rests after six days of work. And, and he lays that down for us um, to um, give us a, a, a model. Um, you know, that obey the Sabbath for in six days the Lord created the heavens and the earth and the seventh day he rested. Um, and so the question is, what about firefighters or um, uh, ER doctors or even, you know, like a, a family physician, you know, in a small town or, or an obstetrician or, a, yeah, obstetrician? Um, you know, what, what about that? And so what, what you do is you, you remember how the law is connected in Scripture. And what's the, what's the final two-piece summary of the whole law? Love, love God and love neighbor. And how is that spread out into 10? Four and six. Yeah, the, the first four are love God of the 10 commandments. So you've got two, love God, love neighbor. And then you've got that spread out into 10. Mostly the first four are how to love God. And the last six are how to love neighbor. Um, Calvin said the first five are how to love God. And uh, the last five are how to love neighbor. And then he kind of said, but five is really a transition because that's authority. Uh, what's number five? Uh, parents. parents. Yeah, honor your mother and father. And that's the transition there. God has an authority structure in life and you may have somebody who is less intelligent than you or less strong than you or less able than you who may be your boss or leader or father or mother. You know, we had a, a woman in the church here for, for a good while. Um, and, you know, she, she got to sixth grade and realized her parents were both, like, under the norm in mental capacity. That they were actually, like, mentally retarded or whatever you call it today. So I'm not trying to insult anybody. It's just, you know. And, and she realized that as a, as a sixth grader. Um, she's a doctor now. Um, but, but still, that doesn't... Uh, uh, God puts in, in, in life an order for us. And, and so commandment five is that honor your father and mother. And from that flow, all the principles of, you know, obey your government, obey your authorities, obey your, your boss, those kind of things. Whoever God puts in authority um, that you obey, that's Romans 13, 1 Peter 2. Um, and so um, anyway, so that's that. So back to this question. So, fourth commandment, um, we've got a crossover here, as we can have with all the, with all the commandments. And uh, God deals with this in the Old Testament law and says, if you have an ox, if you own an ox, right? Who owns an ox here? <laughs> and, and, and your ox falls into the ditch on the Sabbath day, what do you do? Take your, ox out. Take your ox out of the ditch. What's the principle there that we find in the in the two commandments summary there? Yeah, it's the love your neighbors yourself. Do what's loving because that's who God is. Okay, and so if there, the, why do why do we obey the Sabbath because we love God? Right, we set the side a day. We set the day aside. Um, to, uh, so that we can love God and worship him and, and thank him and, and uh, praise him, that kind of thing. Um, we also don't uh, employ uh, other in individuals or make them work on the day uh, because we love them. That's love your neighbor, right? And, and so, um, uh, but if, those, if, if on the day, the Sabbath day, uh, there's somebody in peril, 
it is not loving to leave them in peril. And so it's not a breaking of the Sabbath to do what somebody or something in peril needs. It is a fulfillment of the Sabbath. Uh, so Jesus is walking through the grain fields on the Sabbath. He and his disciples, and they're hungry. And remember last week what we talked about, Sabbath has those two aspects to it. Um, one is worship. I'll give you the other one. We, we rest on the day to worship. Why else do we rest on the day? Why has God put it there? We need it. Restoration. We need it. Rest and restoration. Okay? Um, and so we, we look to doing what restores. And so Jesus is walking through the grain field, and his disciples are hungry. And if they walk through the day without eating, they get to the first day of the week without famished and down on their energy instead of restored, don't they? All right? So we use the day, the Sabbath day, to recharge our batteries, so to speak. Not that we're doing it, but we're, we're doing it by resting. Uh, and so Jesus calls the Pharisees out on this. And they say, well, you're, you're picking, you know, you're harvesting. <laughs> you know, and that's the part about worldly employments. But that wasn't Jesus' worldly employment. He wasn't harvesting grain to sell it. Okay, that's, that's work for the farmer on the other six days. But the farmer gets the rest one day a week. One day a week where he doesn't have to worry about, do I need to fertilize today? Do I need, need to get the irrigation going? Do I need to, do I need to pick the you know, heads of grain uh, today? No, God says, just rest. Trust me. Um, trust me. And, and so um, uh, with the Sabbath day, if there are instances where there are people in per peril or, or things will um, get really messed up, okay, uh, then as a loving person, we fulfill that need. But as we fulfill that need, we say, oh, crud. I got to do this work on this day. But I should do this work on this day because it's for the, you know, for the good of, you know, whatever is going on. So if your child is, is sick and is running a 105 fever, you take her to the emergency room or him to the emergency room. And the doctors are good and the nurses are good for working on that day because then your daughter doesn't die from meningitis or whatever your, your daughter or son, son has. Um, and so... Uh, those, those things that are kind of required pieces of love for neighbor or others or the animals we care for, as in the case of an ox, okay? Where we have, we've been commanded to have dominion over the earth. So we're in charge of the ox. We're in charge of the ox's well-being. So, you know, if, you're, if your dog, you know, gets, you know, hit by a car, not killed, but broken leg, whatever, it's okay to take your dog to the vet. Um, and you always want to ask the question, can I wait till Monday? Or will there be harm done by me waiting? And so there are certain things that, that um, you know, kind of would be loving uh, to other people that really can wait till Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday or something like that. So we ask those questions. And so, um, uh, so yeah, the, the, the doctor, you know, like the uh, pediatrician in a small town who's, you know, the solo doctor in his practice or, or whatever, if he's just on call in his larger practice and there are sick kids who need to be seen, that's good for him um, to, take care, to take care of those needs because that is loving neighbor and all the commandments are tied. All those 10 commandments and every other commandment is tied um, to loving, loving neighbor and loving God. And because I, I love my neighbor, because my neighbor bears God's image. So as I love my neighbor, I'm, I'm loving God too, because he's created this person or this animal or, or whatever. Um, and, and so, you know, if, you, if the fire department, you know, has some problem with plumbing and they can't Fill, I don't know, fill, <laughs> have the water in case someone gets a fire and you're someone that can take care of that, you go you go in because what if somebody has a fire on Sunday afternoon or, or Sunday evening or even early Monday morning? Um, you want to take care of that 
so that people who bear God's image um, don't suffer or don't don't have harm. Okay. So then yeah, Matthew. You know, go Matthew and then Allison. Yeah. You might want to take Allison next, but okay, um, Allison. <laughs> So then how would those people proceed through the rest of the week um, to take another Sabbath or whatever? If they can, do it. So, for instance, I'm off on Mondays. I check my email in case one of you dies or one of your parents dies or one of your kids dies. I do. I see all your emails. I see all your whatever. Um, if you can, wait till Tuesday because my heart goes up like this every time I get an email from all you <laughs> on Monday or, or a text on Monday. Uh, but, but that's not, that's not a big deal. I just see it. And I say, and I ask that question because for me, I am working all day. I get up at six 30 and I finish at about eight 30 PM, um, with all the stuff I'm doing. Uh, uh, and, and so, you know, when you get that prayer email, you know, John is done with his work for the day. Okay. That's the last thing I do. Um, and so Mondays I take off and I don't do housework on Mondays. Um, I, I just do stuff that's now for me it's weird because the worship part has been taken care of on sunday but the rest part gets taken care of on monday um so i'm watching nfl football or sorry i'm watching nfl football highlights or something i want to watch or sitting around or you know, whatever that kind of thing but just rest um instead of um like taking care of something in the yard or fixing the washer or something like that. Yeah. So does that make sense? So, so with somebody like if they're a doctor and they end up having to work on Sunday and it's a surprise, if they're able to take another day off that week, great, or have somebody else fill in for them. Great. But maybe they're not able to because they're already scheduled in and then they can just try to work, do whatever, maybe take the <coughs> evenings, off easier like not fix things in the evening and just mm -hmm. so that they have because built into us in our frame which god knows when he creates the sabbath uh, law built into our frame is we need that rest um and by the way countries that have done away with that like france during the i think the french revolution did away with sundays and they, they just worked seven is that right they added a day it was eight they actually went to a 10 day week for the law wow yeah, and it didn't it didn't work. No. <laughs> Matthew, your question. Yeah, and so I don't want to get in, into a, like a what aboutism or you know gotcha question, but yeah, but like so for how much do you take into uh, account the fact that while we're all made in God's image, we are all fundamentally different as well. Yes. So one may find rest in one thing, whereas another might find it in another. In another. Yeah, and so that's where you go to principles. Yeah. And so, in fact, you know, like, like uh, my family, Betsy and Mallory and I, we typically walk or, and we have like a one mile walk around this pond that's across the street behind their yards. And, and you know, a, a few Sundays ago, it was like, that would be really restful for me. But most Sundays, it's like, oh, I don't want to walk a mile, you know. And, and so it's just and I'm, I'm working through these things, you know, uh, worship and rest in my heads in my head <laughs> um, uh, in my head when I, when I make that decision and so for some people something is, is restful um, and then you want to with whatever's restful you want to tie that into in that rest is my attention taken off the Lord and it's not that we have to be thinking seriously about theology every minute of, of the day you, you can't do that I can't even do that during the during the work day um, but you don't want something that, that kind of consumes you into something that is just uh, one of the things God says in, about Sabbath is, is it's not a day like every other day of the week. And that's a good little litmus test kind of question for you to ask yourself with various, with various activities. But for some things, uh, for some people, it's, uh, an item is, is completely rest for other, for others, it's, it's work. And, and we just want to be careful because I know on Sabbath, my, and every other day, my heart is deceitful above all else and beyond cure, you know, the Jeremiah 7, 8. And so I may have something I want to get done, work, want, something I want to accomplish, and I say, that would be restful for me. 
<laughs> pulling all those vines out. Um, and, and so you just want to, you know, kind of question yourself back and forth and that kind of thing. And not, not to get stressed about this, but realizing this, God puts this here for our good. And we want to absorb as much good as we can on the day. Um, because God wants that for us, but we want that too. And, and, and the desire is, in a, in a functional way, is that we step out on Monday, for you guys, fully charged and ready to serve your, love your neighbor by the vocation that God has given you to do. Whether that's, you know, you're at home doing something or whether that's you're out, you know, off, off home or in home doing work for an employer, you're, you're, you're refreshed and you're not worn out from what you did the day before. Yeah. Yeah. And because the reason I ask is, you know, obviously times are slightly different since the time that, you know, the 10 commandments were given. And, and it's much hard. Yeah. It's much harder today <laughs> versus 1952 yeah. to, uh, obey the sabbath day because well, you just didn't have the choices to disobey the sabbath day back in 1952 and now you're weird if you obey the sabbath day yeah yeah and, and so and also we've we've moved from a largely physical workforce to sedentary in the sense that yeah you know i don't i sit behind a computer for you know eight to ten hours a day yeah so sitting doesn't seem like the most restful thing for me. And I'm not suggesting yeah. like go out and do exercise or, but like yeah. walking around in yeah. nature yep. is, sound, sounds very appealing to me on a Sunday, yeah. especially when you, you can look at the trees and say, isn't it cool that God right. declared this good and he made me to yeah. appreciate the same thing that he finds yeah. good and, and appealing. So. Yeah. And so that's good. That's a good uh, applying of the principles because if your worldly employment has you in front of a computer screen all day and your neck and head and shoulders are, are hurting, that kind of thing, then, you know, on, on the Sabbath day, it might be a good thing to, to take a walk. Now, don't take a speed walk and, you know, or, you know, get sore or go, go for so long that you're sore. But, but also that and what Matthew brings into it is, you know, especially if we're out, you know, and, and we're on a trail or something or just looking at the trees in someone's yard and the grass and that kind of thing. Romans 1 tells us that when we see the creation, uh, that reminds us of God. We know God has created this, and so we're especially mindful of that, like on a Sabbath day, if, we, or if we're taking a walk, that we look at the grass and the trees and say, you know, God, you're amazing. All these things that are functioning, that you put in order, and it's beautiful. And it's beautiful. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, Let's go on to, uh, we're finishing up Deuteronomy. Let me take us to there. Go ahead and open your Bibles to Deuteronomy. What book of the Bible is it? Fifth book. Fifth book, good. And who wrote it? Moses. Yes, that's right. I hear that correct intonation by many of you. It's Moses. All right, so some, some Deuteronomy highlights. Um, let's take a look at uh, Deuteronomy 6. Did we hit this last week? I was looking at this uh, it, later in the week, and I thought, hmm, I'm not sure. Okay, let's look at it. So Deuteronomy 6, um, 5 and 6. Um, And uh, let's let's read this. And uh, how about uh, Randy and Laura? Can you read five and six? So we're in Deuteronomy six, five and six. And this is what uh, the Jews considered to be the heart of the law. And um, when Jesus was asked, "What is the greatest commandment?" and when he asked the same question of someone else, um, this was it from Deuteronomy uh, six, five and six. So we talked about this, but I don't think we read it. So let's go ahead and read it. Uh, Randy, verse five. Love the Lord your God with Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Okay. Um, so here's where we get the greatest commandment. This is what Jesus is quoting. This is what Jesus is looking for when he asks, I think it was a teacher of the law or a scribe, he asks this question and he says, You've answered well, you're not far from the kingdom of God when when the scribe gave this answer. Um, 
So that's, we get that from Deuteronomy. Um, what's her, uh, just as we're getting in our heads, what's in Deuteronomy, a uh, review of what we've, what we've talked about um, here is um, what gets repeated in Deuteronomy? Two big things get repeated in Deuteronomy. The law gets repeated, so that's the nom there, the, the N-O-M, that's nom, like nominal. We get that word from it. It means just, just by law, but not really at heart. But uh, uh, nom means law. Um, what else is repeated in Deuteronomy for this second generation of Israelites about to head into the promised land under Joshua? The history and mistakes of the first generation. Yeah, the history and mistakes of the first generation. And so that's, that's what we see in the um, front part of the book in the first four chapters, really, um, history. Um, so, but greatest commandment, uh, pretty uh, close uh, to the front of the law being repeated is this greatest commandment. So that comes from Deuteronomy. Um, another thing that comes from Deuteronomy is uh, what we can call the Joshua mandate, and that's chapter 7, maybe on the same page uh, uh, for you in your Bibles. And um, we used to talk about this a lot in the early years of our, our, our church. Um, Joshua mandate is not a, a phrase you'll find in Scripture. It's just something uh, we use. Uh, you could say, you know, what Joshua is commanded is to how to interact with his culture. So when Joshua is uh, entering into the promised land, and the Israelites are entering into the promised land, God gives this mandate about how to interact with the culture in the promised land. Key, 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 in the promised land. And in fact, he, he gives a different mandate for Joshua for when they encounter people who don't live in the promised land who are potentially warlike toward them. And, and toward those who are not uh, inhabitants of the promised land, who are not proper subjects of God's judgments right then. That's what God is doing in promised land conquest. He's judging Canaan. Um, from Galatians 15, we see that. Um, but uh, uh, those who are outside the promised land, if they come head to head with them, they're to seek to make a treaty first. Seek to be at peace first. Because they're not subjects of God's judgment. And their land is not land that God intends to give to his people. God defines the promised land from the, the wadi of Egypt, the uh, little brook on the, the east side of Egypt, all the way up to the Euphrates River, which is like a Syria area. And that's their land. So if someone's in there, they're subject to God's judgment through uh, military conquest. But if they come from outside that um, and are, are warlike, um, God tells his people, hey, seek a treaty if you can. And if not, if they're going to come at you, okay, then go at them, and I'll be with you. Okay. But for people in the promised land, we have uh, the Joshua mandate, uh, Joshua 7, verses 1 through 6. And uh, let's start on, on in the back there, Joyce and Faith, and then go across the, the Narrens there, um, and maybe up uh, to Elijah if we, need, if we need you, Elijah, on this one. Okay, 7-1. Okay, so a couple of things just as we're looking at this. Um, key qualifier in, in that, right in that first phrase there, eight words in or something like that. What's the qualifier God gives before he starts telling them how to act toward these non-Israelites? When you enter the land. Okay, so this is promised land people, Canaanites, who Genesis 15, Abraham is told, I'm not giving you, God tells Abraham, I'm not giving you the land now because their sin has not reached its full. But it will sometime when your descendants have come along. And at that time, 
I'll destroy this land as judgment upon them, and, and you'll take it over. Okay, and so that's just a continuation of this um, hundreds and hundreds of years later now with Moses, about 600 years later with Moses uh, receiving this. Okay, um, and what are they to do to them um, in verse 2? How are they to interact with these people in Canaan? Destroy them totally. And this is what we talked about last week when we looked at this uh, passage here. The, um, it, it's the same, same uh, word as um, the whole burnt offering. Uh, give them up over to me. Um, it's the same word Paul uses in Galatians, anathema. Uh, and so when the, the Old Testament is translated into Greek, 300 B.C., um, the word used here, destroy them totally, is anathema. Uh, Paul uses this in Galatians 2 and 3 when he's talking about those who are messing around with the gospel who are in the church and saying circumcision is required to be saved. Uh, um, Paul says, let them be anathema. And, and Paul's saying, you know, let them be totally destroyed for being in the church and messing around with the gospel message. Um, okay. Um, Onward, verse 3, Jeff. Do not intermarry with them. Do not give your daughters to their sons or take their daughters for your sons. For they will bring us from the land you followed me and say, I am God. And the Lord's anger will burn against you and will quickly destroy you. So, when they're dealing with people in the promised land, how do they interact with them? Totally destroy them. How about if the daughters are good looking? Destroy them. <laughs> That's right. And so, and, and because they'll be, an, they'll be an ensnaring influence. And, and bring God's people to worship other gods. They'll start making compromises. So don't give your daughters to your sons in marriage. Don't give their, their daughters to your sons in marriage and their sons to your daughters in marriage. Destroy them totally. What if, what if one of the promised land people says, um, but I agree, your God is God. Then you take them in. Then you take them in. And who's that? Rahab. Rahab. That's right. So again, this is not a, a racial thing like we talked about last week and we've talked about a lot in the past. It's a religious thing. And so God is, we, we rightly call the promised land the holy land because holy means what? Set apart. Yeah. This land from the Wadi of Egypt to the Assyrian or the um, uh, Euphrates River or the river as it's called in the Old Testament is set apart for the worship of the one true God and no other God. God's going to allow, like Paul says, when he's out in the nations preaching the gospel, God has let you get by all this time, but no more. Now he's getting the gospel to you. And so God lets all the nations, Babylon, Assyria, Egypt, and everywhere else worship other gods. Now they're all welcome to stream to Jerusalem, like the Queen of Sheba coming down from Africa somewhere, uh, and, and give honor and, and, and worship to the one true God. Um, you're allowed to be like um, uh, Ruth, um, or sorry, Naomi. You're allowed to be like Naomi. You're allowed to be like um, uh, Rahab and become Israel, just like some Egyptians had left Egypt under Moses. And we read that, you know, three to five different places in the first five books of the Bible, that there were some Egyptians among them who'd come out among them because they were convinced <laughs> by the ten plagues that God was God and all their animal gods weren't. Uh, um, so, so in the promised land, um, you totally destroy so that this land 
is set up, set apart from all the nations of the earth, from all the places of the earth, to be the one place where what should be happening on all the earth is actually happening. Now, what should be happening on all the earth, even today? The worship of the one true God. Following him, worshiping him, loving him, because God has created all people. So everybody owes God worship and, and obedience and remembrance and praise and thanks. Um, but God sets apart one land in the Old Testament. This is why bringing idols into the land is so foul. Why worshiping other gods in the land is so foul. Um, it, it's because, wait, you can do that in other lands, but not here. Um, and, and so that's, it's just a, a very... I, it's a thing you have to keep in mind in the Old Testament to understand the Old Testament and to understand the holy war that's done in the book of Joshua. This is, this is not um, a just war or a, you know, whatever kind of war theory you want to have with Joshua. It is a holy war. It's God cleaning out one space, one little space on earth that will worship him and acknowledge him only and that won't say, well, I think Baal brings the rain. That was the idea with Baal, that he was the rain god. Um, but, but to say, no, God, God brings the rain. He rides the clouds. He sends the thunder. He sends the rain. Um, okay, so that's the, Joshua, that's the Joshua mandate there. Today, what is the promised land? It's the church. The church. Is it the United States? No. 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 Okay. So what do we do? Joshua, Deuteronomy language. What do we do with our neighbors and our society who are not in covenant with God? That the new covenant in Christ's blood, they haven't signed up for it. What do we do with them? How do we interact with them? Treaty. Peace. Okay, and so Paul says, pray for your leaders that you might live in peace. Right? Says that to Timothy. First Timothy. Um, and so you see Jesus interacting with, with Greeks and Romans. We call this the Jeremiah mandate. Um, you can find that in Jeremiah 29, uh, where Jeremiah instructs the exiles in Babylon how to interact with their culture. And he says, pray for the city to which God has called you. For if it prospers, you too will prosper. And don't expect to be back fast. It's going to be 70 years. So Plant gardens and have your sons and daughters marry, not non-believers. But, but don't wait for the marriage to happen back in the promised land. Don't say, oh, we're going to be back in six months. Let's schedule the wedding for then. <laughs> Just go ahead and have your daughters and sons get married to other believers while you're in exile. That's the Jeremiah uh, mandate, Jeremiah 29. And that's the, that's the treaty uh, mandate. When you're among other people who are outside the promised land, Here's how you act. Um, but inside the promised land, uh, you make this. So if the church is the promised land today, which it is, we come here and all your neighbors sit next to you, acknowledge there is one God and no other. And we owe him obedience and worship. Everyone admits that. Even non-believers come in here and they say, okay, I'm in a foreign territory. I'm in a foreign country here, and this is not a Buddhist temple. This is not a Hindu temple. This is not a Jewish synagogue. Here, Jesus is king. And so they don't expect, you know, they don't, they don't erect, you know, a, a Buddhist statue in here or put up pictures of all the Hindu gods here. And, and um, because this is, this is the one place. This is a set-apart, the church is the set-apart land, where God and God alone, revealed in Jesus, is worshipped and, and thanked. Okay? Now, when we step out of this building, that's not the case. We're in Babylon, which is what, just for the fun of it, go to 1 Peter 5 at the very end. Yeah, Matthew. So, it, it, so where the church is... 1 well, Peter 5, very end, uh, a little before Revelation. Yeah. Is, is the promised land. Yeah. There is a right then to expel 
non-believers from the church, um, you know, but realistically, you know, when they visit, the opportunity to, uh, you know, take on the belief system should they be elect, but yeah. not to persist within the church if they're not, if they were just like troublemakers or something. Exactly. We'll, we'll get, I'll, I'll answer that more in full in just a moment. Um, and so, um, verse 13, 513, right at the end, Peter is in prison in Rome, um, and he's writing this letter. Uh, it's, poss it's possible he's not in prison yet, but he's in Rome already, about to be arrested, if not arrested already. And um, probably he is just uh, wanting uh, to uh, identify what the world's culture is. And so, um, what's he what's he say here? John, can you read this for us? First Peter five thirteen. She who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends you her greeting, and so does my son Mark. Okay. Um, okay. So the group of people are described as that Peter's with. How are they described here in this verse? Babylonians. She who's in Babylon. She is in Babylon, and what else? <coughs> chosen. Okay, so who are they? Believers. They're believers. And where are they? In Babylon. In Babylon. Are they, is Peter really in Babylon? No. No, he's not. And we, we know that from church history. He's not in Babylon. He's in Rome. What does he call Rome? Babylon. Babylon. Uh, John calls the world and its culture Babylon <laughs> in the book of Revelation. And, and so it, it, another just tip, tip of the hat to the, the Jeremiah mandate, or how do you act out in the world today when you're outside the church? Because no longer is the promised land a land like it was when Jesus was on the earth. Uh, but now the promised land where the citizens of God are citizens of what Jerusalem? The heavenly Jerusalem. No longer citizens of the earthly Jerusalem unless they happen to be Israelites who have believed in Jesus. Okay? And so there's a shift as to what the promised land is. And, and Paul says, you know, like we looked at last week in Galatians 4, you don't want to be citizens of the earthly Jerusalem. You want to be citizens of the heavenly Jerusalem. And you can be a citizen of the heavenly Jerusalem whether you live in, in Spain or France or Turkey or Babylon, or Egypt, or Algeria, you know, which was New Testament stuff um, there. Okay, so so uh, Peter calls <laughs> world culture, or Rome itself, the Roman Empire, Babylon. Um, Babylonian Empire was dead and gone. Uh, 612, they get it, um, or sorry, uh, a little bit later. Uh, 539, uh, they get uh, conquered. Okay. So then... To whom Peter is writing would understand him to be saying that we're that the believers are essentially in physical exile. Yes. Okay. Yeah, and and he talks about in Second uh, Peter one, uh, basically he's he's finishing his exile on the earth here, um, and so um, uh, so who are subjects of the Joshua mandate today? And this is what Matthew is asking about. So who does the Joshua, back to the Old Testament, who does the Joshua mandate happen to? Canaanites. Canaanites. In the land. In the land. What's the land today? The church. the church. Now, Rahab's a Canaanite in the land. Does she get totally destroyed? No. no. Um, she becomes an Israelite. Um, so today, um, what do we... What do we do? Let me ask this question. Uh, throughout, the, throughout the Old Testament, um, are there ever non-Jews, non-Israelites, who come into the land to trade or even live? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There are. What are they forbidden to do if they're living in the land and they're not an Israelite? Promote other gods. Promote other gods. And so now let's just push this forward to today. If the church is the promised land, is a non-believer allowed to come in? Yes. What is the non-believer not allowed to do? Promote other gods. Promote other gods. Um, 
Uh, what if there's a person in the church who has uh, 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 taken membership vows and then says, well, I'm, I'm a, a Muslim now and starts talking to other people about the uh, values of Islam. What does the church do to that person? Yeah, totally destroyed is not physical. Just like, <laughs> just, just like um, holy war today is not physical, it's spiritual. Just like the, um, uh, just, the land is not physical, it's, it's spiritual. The sword that the church possesses is not physical. We don't physically kill people. We don't physically kill Canaanites because they're in the church and they don't believe. We don't put people to death. What's our, what's our sword? Okay. Scripture, good, Christina. The New Testament defines that for us. The sword is the word of God, uh, Ephesians 6. Um, what does Jesus have coming out of his mouth? You know, the sword, sword of the spirit, uh, which is the word of God. And, and uh, so if, uh, Hebrews 4.12 says that as well. And so by the, the word of God is our standard. And so if we, the, the gospel is holding the sword to somebody who is not a believer, somebody who's a Canaanite, and they can either have the response of the king of Jericho, fight, or they can have the response of Rahab, bow the knee to the king. Uh, and so that's what the gospel is. You know, the sword of the spirit is the word of God. And, and then Paul says, and pray for me that I might make it known. Um, as I should. That's Ephesians 6. Um, and so excommunication is the New Testament version of Old Testament holy war. Because we're saying the church is the holy land. You can promote Islam. You can promote Mormonism. You can promote, promote the Jewish faith, Buddhism, Hinduism, atheism outside the church. You're free and we're under the age of grace but you can't come in here and do that. You can't. You could even, you know, so, so, so if somebody insists on being here, the elders of the church go to that person and they exercise with great patience and trying to convince that person otherwise and of the merits of Christianity, we'd excommunicate that person. Okay, and again, that's not a physical um, totally destroy, but it's a remove from the land. You remove that person from the church if they're not just here saying, hmm, I'll consider this guy. Your people are sure nice. Um, I'm thinking about it. And so there are uh, uh, non-Israelites in the promised land who are like that. Um, a lot of times they're servants. They come into the land because there's profitable service and they say, hey, can I serve you? Um, and and uh, so they come here, but they're not allowed to bring their their um, foreign gods with them into the land. They're not allowed to promote their foreign gods while they're here. And hopefully they become a believer in the one true God. Okay. So that's, but in Deuteronomy, we have the Joshua mandate, totally destroy, keep the land pure. It's a land set apart. And so that's both in, in terms of um, membership. That's why we have membership examinations to make sure that all members have saving faith in Jesus. Um, and um, yeah, and that's, that's why in our, our preaching and teaching, we're not bringing non-biblical stuff in and teaching that. Because we don't want to bring stuff in from the world because this is the one place on earth you get to hear truth unadulterated by what the world thinks is good. Okay, and that's a Joshua mandate thing. So that's... You know, that's what we're doing. That's why I change words on hymns and songs. <laughs> if you look at a lot of our songs and I don't, I put it in like seven points so that you can't read it because I don't want you to see my name there. Um, but I change words and songs because Joshua mandate. I don't want you singing something that is theologically incorrect. And most, uh, fortunately, the hymn writers were mostly theologians. Contemporary Christian writers are musicians who are bringing up the drivel of evangelical Christianity. Okay, and so that's why we sing fewer contemporary songs in our church. Not because we're against contemporary, 
it's just, I have to change so many words. Um, and that's fine. And I've, we've done that. Stuart and I did that with a song or two and he was in here um, because this is the church. We don't bring in stuff that's not biblically accurate and ask you to sign on to it by singing that. All right. Okay. So that's Joshua mandate. Um, yeah, Matthew. A potentially problematic question. So with respect to liberal churches that are constantly bringing in non-theologically correct beliefs. Their Old Testament divided Israel and, and under the covenant curses. Yeah. Right. And so is there any obligation for Bible believing churches to quote excommunicate them? Yeah. And so that's why the PCA, for instance, is not an official fellowship with the PCUSA. Because of that principle, uh, we are in fellowship denominationally with other denominations like the Orthodox Presbyterian Church and, and, and various lots of different churches. We are, um, by the way, General Assembly is coming up this week, so I'll be there uh, Tuesday through uh, Friday. Um, yeah, um, 17, 14, 20, we talked about this last week. The command to have a king is in Deuteronomy. And so this is uh, prescribed for God's people when they get into the promised land. It's not an afterthought of God. It's not a concession of God. It's a command uh, that God gives there. This makes sense because all the Old Testament foreshadows Jesus and the gospel. And what is Jesus? King. King. And that's not a concession. Um, oh, I keep going one too many. Chapter 28, the blessings and curses. Um, 29, let's take a look at 29, 29. If you've heard this expression before, but it's a doctrine that we, we talk about the doctrine more than we talk about this verse. Um, Deuteronomy 29, 29 is, is we find this concept in, in here. Um, the secret things versus things revealed. Brenda, can you read that for us? The secret, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may follow all the words of this law. Okay. Um, any ideas or thoughts or uh, as to what the secret things and the things revealed? Now, remember what Moses has been talking about from chapter 5 onward as context for this verse. What's been revealed to God's people? The law, his commands. And what's Moses say here, verse, 20, 20, verse 29, what's he say about the things revealed? They belong to the chosen people. Okay, so God's people have things that God has revealed, and what's their responsibility toward those things? Uh, to follow all the words of this law. But there are also, an, there's another category of things besides the things revealed. So this is for us as believers. Uh, well, let's, sorry, let's just go on. What, what's the other category? Secret things. The secret things. So that's something that is not revealed. What might that be? The day Jesus returns. The day Jesus returns is one of those things that's not revealed. We don't know the day. Um, do you know if you're going to be in the same uh, job that you're in today, three years from now? Do you know that? No. no. Does God know? Yes. Yes. That's a secret thing. So God tells us what we need to know is this concept. Yeah, God tells us what we need to know. Um, and so when someone asks, I'm just you know, seeking what the will of God is, we say, okay, what are the things revealed? How can you obey God the best? That's the will of God for you. Look at all the commandments. How can you best love God and best love neighbor in this situation you're wondering about? And, and, and you seek that out and you walk, walk in that way, um, you know, that uh, you would follow all the words of this law. Um, but you don't know if you're going to get cancer. That's a secret thing. God knows the day. If, if you're going to get cancer, God knows the day and the doctor you're going to be seen, and the words you will hear. Mm -hmm. And so, what would we call the secret things in terms of, like, Westminster Confession, how do we put it? 
Mysteries is a good biblical word. That's that that it, that's true. Westminster Confession. There's a whole chapter on it. Chapter three. Secret things. God knows them. We don't. Decree. Secret things are decree. God knows everything, and he will make what he wants to happen, happen without violating the will of us, right? We'll do it, but it will have been his will, and he will have arranged it to happen. Um, like, you know, me and pizza. There's pizza, and it's free. I will, of my own free will, take a piece of that pizza, um, but that will have been God's decree, and God will have made the fact that I am taking a bite of pizza at 7.34 and 22 seconds in this location, that he made that happen. But when that happens, my will has not been violated. I was doing exactly what I wanted to do. Free pizza? And I pick up a piece of pizza and I eat it. Okay, so that's how God works, and you see that with uh, Moses and Pharaoh and all that, that kind of thing. But those are, uh, so secret things is decree. Um, Things revealed, those are commands, um, and, and a little bit more in the category of chapter 5, providence. God works out his decree through providence, through our obediences, and even through our disobediences. You know, so he works out his providence through Pharaoh's disobedience. Uh, but he also works out his uh, providence through David's obedience when Goliath challenges the nation. Um, so God, God can do either, um, uh, with us. Um, okay. And then 34, one through eight, that's where we get, uh, uh, Poe's death there. Mo, uh, Moe's death. Mo, my dad had a friend named Moses who went by Moe's. took me a long time to figure that out. My dad always talked about Moe's. And then I realized one day, oh, that guy's name must've been Moses. Um, not the Dwight's cousin. Yeah. That's right. Yep. Um, but uh, so those are the things you find in the in the book of Deuteronomy. Um, uh, blessings and curses. We'll look at those a whole lot more when we get into prophets, because the prophets are always uh, the prophets do two things. They say, here uh, here's God's law. You're not obeying it, and so here are the covenant curses that we saw in Deuteronomy 28. They're happening around you, aren't they? And God's people are saying, yeah, they are. God's withholding the rain. Um, foreign nations are invading us, and we're losing those battles. And, and, and the prophet says, okay, those covenant curses, it's because you haven't followed the law. But God says in the law, if you follow me, I'll then bless you. That's all the prophets are doing. Um, okay. There we go. Uh, next week, we'll start in with uh, Joshua. Very related. Um, to Deuteronomy um, and Numbers. Numbers is preparing God's people you know, as a second generation army to go into the land. Deuteronomy is Moses' last word to the people, refreshing them in the law, refreshing them in their own history, uh, giving them instructions about um, uh, uh, recommitting themselves to the covenant once they get into the promised land. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, here's how you interact with those who are in the promised land, completely wipe them out. Um, okay, um, let's pray.